Um, all right, guys, I think we can go ahead and get started here. So for those joining and continuing to join, welcome. This is a Forward Fest event. Um, my name is Grady Buchanan with NBNG, Venture Fund of Funds here in the state of Wisconsin. Today, we're going to talk to three out of state, out of market venture capital firms and what they're trying to do and look at here in the Midwest and in Wisconsin and how their firms operate. Um, but first and foremost, again, Forward Fest event uh, right here in Madison, Wisconsin. And if we can, we'll just go to the next slide and thank our sponsors first and foremost. Um, and so again, thank you to everyone. I know this is the last day of Forward Fest, so I'm sure everyone's worn down with a lot of events. Thank you much for attending ours. And uh, yeah, we can just jump into it at this point. So again, most know who I am. Um, we'll introduce and go around the room here. Uh, what I want from the three of you is just, you know, where you started in venture, what your firms are looking at today, and um, just kind of set the framework for some of these answers that we'll go through in a bit here. But uh, Jessica, why don't we start with you? Sure. And where you located, Jessica. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Grady and NBNG and Ford Festival for having us. We're thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is Jessica Peltzatulov. I'm founding partner of Hannah Gray. Uh, we're a new early stage VC fund focusing on customer centric founders reimagining everyday experiences to improve work and life. Um, I am originally from Minnesota, which you will only hear when I say I'm from Minnesota, uh, but I've been living in New York uh, for over for close to 18 years now. So this is this is home, but certainly have a soft spot for entrepreneurs in the Midwest and for what they're building um, at our firm. We're really looking for early stage technologies around themes like future of work, commerce, SaaS, um, marketplaces, education, and wellness. I'm specifically investing at the pre-seed. My, my background is I spent the first decade of my career uh, on the customer side, uh, working with Fortune 500 brands with marketing, and ultimately working on Verizon's media strategy helps startups start to commercialize their technology um, and find their first customers. So where we, we really look to focus is understanding what are commercial applications of these emerging technologies and how can we really help around the branding, the go-to-market, customer acquisition, and things like that. Um, so look forward to being here and just sharing more. And also just saying, please ask questions. Uh, we all probably speak very unfiltered. Uh, so just looking forward to being helpful and transparent um, to give you guys some perspectives. Yes, Jessica, good point. I'll, everyone, throw your questions in the chat. Uh, I know Aaron at Ford Festival is going to be monitoring for any technological issues, um, but we'll go through those at the end. Uh, Peter, if you want to go next. Sure. And thanks, Jessica, too. It's so interesting to see where we're going to intersect. Um, so I'm Peter. I'm partner at Social Impact Capital. We're an early stage impact focused venture capital firm. Uh, so we invest in basically anything that touches the environment or something social in some way or other. Um, I'm originally, believe it or not, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, though I sound like this, which is very, not just non-Pittsburghian, um, but also um, very British. But uh, I split my time between England and uh, New York. We're a remote team. Uh, I know there's some questions today about where you're based and does that actually matter? So um, we're looking very far and wide at our firm. We do seed investments. Um, we are generally sector agnostic and geography agnostic. Um, I started my career uh, in Silicon Valley 10 years ago. I uh, more recently moved to New York, which is where our firm is based. Um, I started my career really at the intersection of technology and, and wealth management. Um, the last company I was part of was acquired by Adapa, uh, which is a uh, sort of uh, ABC backed um, portfolio company. And uh, I basically moved to the Bay Area because I wanted to do impact investing. And now that's what I do. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, and Seth, last but not least. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Grady, thanks for having me, Jess and Pete. It's great to, great to be on a panel with you guys. Um, yeah, I'm I feel like I'm based in Zoom these days, <laughs> so um, uh, that's kind of where I spend most of my time. But uh, actually, so I'm a partner, founding partner of a venture capital firm out of Boulder, Colorado called uh, Foundry Group. Actually, I say out of Boulder, Colorado, we also don't, we gave up our office in uh, COVID, so <laughs> really we probably are at this point kind of based out, out of Zoom. Um, but in any event, the firm started in Boulder and, and uh, we invest across the US. We manage about a little over $3 billion now. Um, we invest both in uh, early, early and mid-stage technology businesses, but also 
Uh, in other venture funds, we we have about oh, maybe 40, 45 funds that we have investments in. And, and actually most of our direct investing now comes from the portfolio of those uh, underlying funds. Um, and I also, like Jess, have some Minnesota connections. I went to, I went to college in Minnesota, so I've got a, a very deep affinity for the Midwest and I still spend quite a bit of, of time back there. So I'm always happy to be doing things, even though it's virtual in Madison. Awesome. And thank you, Seth. And I know Seth, so for those on the call, Seth recently wrote a book. It's kind of the foundry group mentality. If you're a partner over there, you got to be an author too. Um, so for those who don't know, Startup Communities by Brad or Venture Deals by Jason, Seth now has one as well, which I think will draw some insight into Seth with some of these questions. Um, but thank you all for the background. Again, thank you guys for being here. Um, we can just jump right in because we got uh, too many questions. Um, so and I know you guys can talk all day about this stuff. So venture capital perspective, just jumping right into it. Obviously, this is a Madison based organization that's running this. What was happening here in Wisconsin, education, a lot on the venture capital side here. So specifically looking at geographies, you guys are all over the world, really. I know, Peter, you're in the UK. Um, what brings you to new markets? What's attractive in peripheral ecosystems or unique or smaller markets? I know, Seth, you guys have been in Boulder. You built Boulder for the last 20, 30 years. But for the funds and you guys, and when you're looking outside of where, you know, the UK, New York, specifically Colorado, what's attracted to the state of Wisconsin or the Midwest? Ecosystem characteristics, founders, companies. And then on the reverse side, what keeps you from going into those markets? Um, Jessica, we can start with you. Sure. Um, so for us, we, we specifically invest in U.S. Uh, based companies. We are not international yet, but something that was really important to us that we started to see outside of the coast is I co-founded Women in VC in 2015, which we've grown into the world's largest community for women investors. We're now over 3,500 women across 2,000 firms, over 180 cities, over 60 countries and 37 U.S. states. And so that was really an aha moment for us where we just recognized there's a lot of talent outside of the coast, specifically outside of San Francisco and New York, but you have to know how to find them and you have to know how to really connect authentically with them. Because when we look for new markets, we really wanna understand what domain expertise is here, what talent is here, what customer connections are here and what capital is here. And so when we start to see that there's opportunities bubbling up in these areas, we like to have those on the ground relationships with the accelerators and some of the local funds and start to have relationships with some of the local angels so we can start to find those gems that are in shared working space. But I think it's difficult if you're not building relationships with groups that are on the ground in these markets because that's really when you can start to build more trust and more authenticity in that market as opposed to dipping in and dipping out if you're on the coast. So we're in a really special moment in time where half the time we don't even know where founders are based anymore. And that's a huge advantage. And so to us, it's less about where are you living? Seth, I love that you said you're based in Zoom. That is like the best line that I've heard, but it's, it's so true because it just creates this decentralization of venture and technology and talent in a way that we haven't seen before. And so it's really all about how can you connect with intention and find the right opportunities and the right investors for your business based on what you're working on. So that's really how we think about it as we want to learn about a particular market is really how can we just get more ingrained on the ground to build relationships to find the smart entrepreneurs working on big ideas. Uh, and Peter, I know you're global, so I want to get to you in a second, kind of because you see a lot of different ecosystem types. But Seth, Foundry Group, you guys have been very active. You're obviously based in the middle of the country, Boulder, purposefully so, a long time ago. And now you guys are making investments coast, Midwest. How do you guys cover these new markets and what brings you to a Minneapolis or a Madison or Milwaukee? I think the good news for, for Madison or really any market that's outside of the coast is that the venture industry, I've, I've been in venture now for 20 years, um, and uh, the venture industry's changed a lot since then. I started my career working for a Palo Alto-based firm. I was I was in Colorado. Brad, Brad, my partner Brad Feld and I were in Colorado, but, but the rest of the firm was in, in the Bay Area, and I spent I mean, several years, essentially three Mondays a week, taking the 6 a.m. flight from Denver to San Francisco. It was like you and it was like a bus. I can't there's a name for it. And I can't remember. It was a something something bus. But, you, you know, you'd always see these other people, you know, rushing out to the coast to, um, you know, to make their pitch to West Coast VCs. By the way, that involved, you know, waking up at like 3.30 in the morning because it's, you know, Denver's airport. It's in the middle of nowhere. 
Um, and that was the venture industry for a long time, right? And, and markets uh, like like Boulder, Colorado, that were considered at the time to be kind of backwater markets were um, kind of flyover uh, places, right? And, and so it was really hard to get the focused attention other than for really special transactions, special deals um, from coastal firms. And then when you did, oftentimes there was the request along with the money that was not even a request, but the insistence, hey, um, I'll, I'll invest in, in this business, but you've got to move to San Francisco, right? And I, I actually remember, a time, this is kind of amusing, but I remember a time when of course, the venture industry was historically based in, in Sand Hill, and where I, I had West Coast uh, colleagues, if you will, people that I knew uh, in venture in Palo Alto, who would say, I, "I won't even go up to the city, meaning San Francisco, to make an investment." Like that's that's a step too far. Now, fortunately for all of us, we've come a long way from that, and so there, I think there's a lot less pressure to, although you still occasionally see it, but to move to a new geography to be closer to your investor. I think people understand that. Um, there's wonderful technologies now, Zoom and otherwise, that allow you to connect with people that uh, over over and across distances. And so there's not that same kind of pressure. But that said, there's community and ecosystem development that needs to happen, right? And so you know when you when I think about and it, maybe a recent example, actually an old example is Boulder. We talk about the Boulder thesis in in Brad's book, Startup Communities, that that Grady mentioned. Um, but newer examples might be. Uh, KC, it might be Cincinnati, it might be uh, Minneapolis, where um, there they became there they became a certain uh, sort of center of gravity. We're starting to see this a little bit in Madison, but I would I would encourage you all to think about this, right? Startup communities, long term view, twenty year arc, uh, lots of tent poles. They're not controlled. They're they're uh, mesh networks, not hub and spokes. Um, and they involve lots of different leaders, right? And, and so I think that what all of those communities, starting with Boulder, but but many other places, uh, including those that I mentioned, but but a number of others, um, have in common is that they really kind of help build themselves up. And it's not just about how do we attract capital here; it's how do you create a thriving ecosystem, and then the, the capital will come, right? Because you're going to have more interesting businesses with founders that are helping each other out in in an ecosystem that's super robust. Uh, in a world now where you can. You know, I can be in one meeting, uh, you know, again, in Zoom everywhere, but I can be in one meeting on one coast, uh, you know, and I can hang up and be on the other coast in, in you know, in two seconds as I jump on a different Zoom. And the, so that world is changing. And I think I think along with it, um, venture and the venture industry is becoming much more decentralized in ways that I think we think, or I certainly I think are really, really positive. And I think, Seth, you said a lot in there that we'll dissect a little bit later on, like, is venture still the hyper local game that we always thought it is? Do companies really have to move to see customers? We'll talk about that for sure. But talk about decentralized networks here. Peter, you're in the UK. Um, and thank you. I know it's I know you're in a different time zone. Um, and usually we put Peter through the ringer here because he's always up late. But um Peter, globally, ecosystem-wise, is there any relation to kind of the smaller markets that you see to what you're seeing here in the Midwest uh, in you know, Wisconsin? I know you've covered it a little bit, but any kind of specific positives that you're seeing pop up in these ecosystems that you guys are looking at? Yeah, lots. There's lots of sort of macro trends in the Midwest and other regions in the states where it's actually way more attractive than looking for opportunities in San Francisco or New York or in London for that matter. You know, to Seth's point, when I moved to Bay Area 10 years ago, uh, that was where you were meant to come to do technology. And in fact, I knew nothing about technology or venture capital when I came to the Bay Area, right? Um, and then since then, a decade later, I think a lot of the world has looked to Silicon Valley as a kind of um, kind of potent pole of what's possible in the world of technology. And the last decade, you've seen that entrepreneurial spirit actually spread across the world and different, not just um, you know, nations competing against one another in this sort of technological kind of um, transition, but also locally. And so what you notice is that there are different hubs in the States that produce different brilliant people who are working on usually quite specific projects, which are relevant to the underlying industries and economic drivers of those regions. So there are very specific regions to come to the Midwest and look um, for specific deals and potentially agriculture or mining um, or manufacturing for that matter. And because they're there and, and that naturally is the history of that region, you're more likely to find entrepreneurs working on those challenges. What I would say about the Bay Area in New York, as much as I, I definitely like feel like I was um, very lucky to have those experiences, I think there now are some perversities that have been built into the ecosystems there, which means that um, you know it's really putting a lot of pressure on companies to run at rates that are not realistic relative to where they are today. 
right? And at the early stages, you need a lot of time to get to where you need to be. And what ends up happening in the Bay Area is this beauty contest or pageant behavior where everyone clambers over a deal, a deal gets hot, and then the valuation is pumped up to a size that actually isn't uh, commensurate to the stage of development of that company, which actually puts an immense amount of pressure on that company in the long term and sets up that company also potentially for failure. Um, so what I notice in, in Wisconsin and different areas in the Midwest is they're more reasonable valuations. And as I see what we really specialize in, so one of our um, sort of secret sources on, on what we're up to is getting top decile funds to lead our A rounds. We have a 94% hit rate of doing that across both funds. So I'm talking Andreessen, True Ventures is one of our most frequent follow on financier. How we do that is structure the cap table and the valuation at an early stage that is actually like reasonable um, for, for the company. I think there are also other reasons why you might want to be in the Midwest because it's actually cheaper to build a company ex nilio, right? Like trying to build a business in a shed that costs $2 million is potentially um, uh, not in your interest when you're building a, a business from scratch. Equally, that's happening in New York. Uh, that's also happening to some extent now in Austin and Miami where people have now uh, gone off and there's a lot of, um, you know, um, sort of backlash around that for, for local residences, even though, of course, there are different tax in incentives in those regions that make it slightly more um, sort of um, fertile to, to, build a, to build a business there. Um, and then I also quite like that there is an element where it's like slightly less competitive. Um, and I think that for that reason, you end up being able to look in a region where, because people are not keeping up with what's happening sectorally or industrially, uh, you can find a concentration of people working on some, you know, like I said, in, on projects that are very natural to that area. And because you're not sort of fending off all of these different investors over the deal, you end up finding the diamond and you're better able to find the diamond uh, in a smaller pool, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think you, if I, and if I can just piggyback on there, I, I think you said it beautifully just around like the entrepreneurial spirit has really spread outside of this one concentrated area. And I think a little bit of an inconvenient truth for some people is, is that the Bay can be very disconnected from reality. Um, and not just from a valuation standpoint, but from a customer empathy standpoint, um, mm -hmm. which is a whole separate conversation that like we won't even get down that, <laughs> that wormhole. But um, what we're also seeing with this unbundling of, of San Francisco and Silicon Valley is that you have to go where the entrepreneur is. And that when you have these ecosystems that are coming online and really playing to their strengths, I mean, when I was living through New York coming online back in 2010, 11, 12, and that was coming to life, it was because it was in fintech, because it was media, because it was in fashion and retail and just industries that were very endemic to what New York was good at. Obviously, from there, as the ecosystem has grown, there's just a lot more range. But that's really some of the early sparks of these communities that's so exciting and now with entrepreneurs, it's it's not just the profile that fits the hoodies and, you know, a, a very specific entrepreneurial profile that is um, analogous with that region. It's moms, it's women, it's people of color, it's immigrants, and it's people also that just, they can't necessarily afford the cost of living, they can't necessarily afford talent, it's, it's they want a more diverse environment. Um, these are all just like wonderful benefits that these emerging startup ecosystems have. Well, they're also just much more capital and capital efficient. They're much more scrappy. They have customer relationships, domain expertise. I mean, just the, the stuff you see coming out of the Midwest and healthcare and CPG, the stuff you see coming out of Salt Lake City or on SAS, like there are just so many of these interesting pockets that, that are creeping up. And it's because they have those domain expertise and because they have that customer empathy and because they have those customer relationships and operating experience, it just, it creates really special market opportunities if you can find them. So Jessica, I'm a startup company and I'm in Madison and my general belief, and I'm just starting out, right? It's like, all right, I gotta go to Sand Hill to get some money or I got local angels, whatever. But if I go to a VC, they're gonna move my company over to San Francisco, kind of Seth alluded to this and I'll ask you to go next Seth, but is venture still a hyper local game? Are there new industries? Are there builders in this market today in the Midwest that are attractive industry type wise? Because I mean, let's be honest, we're not all creating photo sharing apps around here. Our customers could be core Midwest yeah. corporations, right? So, but in some of the worries, again, 
I need to move for funding or they're going to move me. I can't really attract the venture fund. There isn't enough talent locally here uh, to scale my business. So how do you address that when you talk to founders that are in the Midwest? Jessica, I'll have you go first. Yeah, um, I would say I don't believe that's true. <laughs> um, I think that you as a founder, especially in this moment of time with future and work and remote work, it's up to you as a founder to really communicate your vision, recruit the right talent, be smart about thinking about fundraising and talent recruitment as a sales funnel. There's a lot of people that are public on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Substack, on Medium that you can find investors and reach out to them. It doesn't matter where you are. It's about demonstrating you have a plan to communicate how you're going to recruit talent, how you're going to build culture, and how you're also going to attract press, customers, talent, investors within the community that you have and why you can do that effectively remotely and why you can still create that cohesive culture to march to the same mission when you're in that remote environment. That's a lot of what we're looking for now is because so many of our founders, they're managing distributed teams, but they're able to just have their runway go so much farther because they're able to pay a fraction of the budget to hire developers in Pittsburgh or in Madison or in Indianapolis or in Nashville. So it's demonstrating your ability to recruit and manage and build culture is really, I think, a key thing that we look for as we're talking to founders in any market now, whether it's coastal or not. Seth, you talk about kind of how, I mean, it wasn't that long ago where Sand Hill was like, if I can ride my bike there, I will invest in this company. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not. And now you see San Francisco trickle to L.A. They're obviously a little bit more mobile and putting people in Chicago, know it or not, to just understand what is here. But you guys have been covering this. Do you agree with Jessica on this, where companies here in the Midwest, capital goes further here, right? Cost of living is a little bit cheaper. Our customers could be this. But when would be the case where you'd want to potentially move a company or work more locally with that company? Are there reasons for that in this, you know, desktop diligence Zoom world we're in now? Yeah, no. And it was always a stupid, stupid thing, right? It's like the laziness of, of venture, <laughs> like never, never overestimate or underestimate, I guess, the laziness of, of venture capitalists. I mean, I think one of the greatest things that's happened in the venture industry was that people, uh, more capital and more new types of venture capitalists have have shown up, right? And so, uh, you know, those those folks, I think, have put pressure on sort of the old guard, if you will. I mean, I, I remember when I started in venture, well, when I started Foundry, right? So we started Foundry in 2007. Um, and I was like a newly minted partner. So it's my it was my first role as a partner. And I ended up, uh, I went to New York. I did a bunch of, uh, my initial investments were in New York City because no one was sort of covering New York, right? I mean, there was, Union Square was there and the precursor to um, uh, First Mark, which was called Pequot Capital was there. Uh, and that was kind of it, right? I mean, Josh had started first round capital, but that was down in Philly and they were doing a little bit in, in New York and Comcast Ventures was also doing just a touch of stuff in New York, but like it was pretty much an open market. It's funny to say that now, right? I'm Jessica's probably laughing about this, but I mean, it really was like that in 2007. So where does a young partner go? Who's like looking for deal flow? I was willing to get on a plane every three weeks from Boulder, Colorado and go to New York. And so I did because Sand Hill wasn't coming out there. And so, you know, those, those, I tell that story just as a vignette of like, you know, there's always benefit, I think, to the scrappiness of kind of the next group of people coming up. And I think the venture industry has benefited significantly. And more importantly, the broader entrepreneurial ecosystem has benefited greatly from new energy uh, coming into the ecosystem and people willing to think differently. Now, I, I do want to say something about sort of the excuse that is, oh, but we're in pick your market that is a smaller market that doesn't have a ton of capital. I think it's, I'm going to call BS on that, right? I mean, I think that's that's what people say when they're not willing to do the work to go on the platforms that Jess just described, right? And seek out the uh, potential investors and really craft the story that they have. That's the like defensive, like, oh, I couldn't possibly raise money, uh, you know, from well-known venture capitalists because pick your reason because, right? And Pete talked about this, right? They've got a strong track record in attracting top tier follow on investors because they do good deals, but also because they position them right. And, and some of that's also, they also just believe that those are the investors that should be looking at those businesses. And so I think, you know, we used to have that a little bit in Colorado. There was this kind of fear of like, well, I, I, I couldn't possibly go and, and, you know, reach out to this top tier investor or gee, gosh, I need to have a local investor you know, Colorado and Colorado's venture, local venture ecosystem is incredibly 
small, right? The net foundry manages $3 billion. The next largest venture fund in Colorado manages like a hundred million dollars or something like that. Like it's, it, there's a huge drop off and usually somewhere between five and 10% of funding into Colorado businesses comes from Colorado funding sources. So 90%, 95% of funding into our businesses in Colorado comes from sources of capital that are outside of Colorado. It's always been like that. Um, and, and so there's no reason that funding has to be hyper-local. And I, I think that was an adage of, I mean, there used to be this idea that like, see, you couldn't possibly be a seed investor unless you were local. And I just, I don't really get it, right? Because it seems, I mean, yeah, of course, we're super helpful and we're former operators and all the things that every venture fund ever says. But like, the truth is, you're, if you're showing up every day at your portfolio company or even every week, right, you're probably, you probably don't have the right management team, right? You're not, you're not doing it right. Um, and so this idea that you have to be sort of hyper local, I just, I don't think it makes sense at all. I, the first investment I ever did as a partner was this company called Admeld in New, in New York. And oh, just to tell you, that, that, those guys. yeah, exactly. And then sign of the times, we, we, yeah. it was a $1 million deal. I split it with Santo Politi from Spark Capital. We put a million dollars in at a 3 million post back when that was the seed deal. And, um, <laughs> and it was in New York and it was a seed deal. Yeah. And I, you know, yeah, I was in New York every three weeks. So I, I spent a bunch of time with him and still very close with both founders. I'm actually an investor in the, one of the founders uh, uh, did, started another company and I'm an investor in that. But I tell that story because it's like, you can, I was 2000 miles away from New York. Like you can do seed investing that way. It's, yeah. it's totally fine. Yeah. I think that, I think what's- That was a successful what, company, by the way. <laughs> no, I, was, I, I mean, I think I was one of their early customers when I was on, when I was on the operating side. But um, I think what's, what's important to think about if you're a founder and a founder listening to this is if you are in one of those markets, ask the VC, what is their diligence process? What does it look like? Are you comfortable committing over Zoom and virtually? How is that different from your traditional process? What do you need to get comfortable and how do you like that relationship to work virtually? Because you also want to find the right fit for you as a as an as an entrepreneur. It's it's a really special, unique relationship. And so, as part of that process, and as part of your fundraising process, don't be afraid to like have a little chutzpah when you're talking to a coastal VC or whoever, and just say, you know, this is virtual. Are you okay with that? And how has it changed your process? And and what should I expect if we do move forward in terms of how much you want to be in person versus what you're doing virtual? And just Level setting all that too, I feel like just builds trust and builds transparency, which also is just another good indicator of you as a, as a business leader. Yeah. I think it's a great point. And Peter, I want to ask you this question directly. Other best practices that you see, and say, I, I want to touch on the valuations in a bit and where they're looking, but you guys are investing right after that kind of pre C round, maybe institutional capital is already there, or maybe you're the first check. Again, local founders here in Wisconsin, there's there's angel money here. There's angel money throughout the Midwest. Cap tables can look how they look. But are there best practices to building strong investor syndicates early on? And what should founders here be thinking about when they hit, you know, the founder groups, the Hannah Grays, the social impacts? How should those cap tables look? Because, you know, without going into war stories, sometimes you can take the wrong capital or you can structure it improperly. Um, and then we do need out of state funds to kind of come in and lead that a round. So how are you seeing kind of best practices? I mean, I, again, you're global, you're covering all these ecosystems. Hmm. What do those cap tables look like? And what would you encourage founders to do early on? Yeah, you know, I think you have to be very careful when you're building your initial app base, right. And I have seen some very ugly things happen. Um, even in areas where you wouldn't expect those ugly things to happen. Mm -hmm. um, like a super pro rata for 50% had a pre-seed, right, uh, in San Francisco for uh, an alternative schools for K-12 education. It's quite, quite miserable sometimes, right? So um, you have to understand that um, you're very much building a community at the early stages. And I should also say that we do do pre-seed. We do seed and pre-seed. Um, we do small investments where we're really excited about you, but we still want to see more traction over time. Um, and so the idea is that you really want to focus into who's strategic sort of value to you, understands what you're doing and can make sort of introductions for you and speak on your behalf to others, particularly at the early stages. And you create this community around you, people who speak on your behalf, word of mouth marketing is actually the best marketing you can do. Um, and then when you're trying to think about like what that looks like, go for the most vanilla, most standard instrument you can possibly use uh, nationally. 
Um, you know, you can say what you will about Y Combinator, but like the SAFE instrument is an incredibly now broadly accepted early stage uh, instrument to use. We accept that at SIC, right? And um, I think that it's really useful of, of getting educated about that instrument and understanding also what is normal at the early stages, how much of your company you know, you're selling off at the early stages, really like finding the resources around that. And there's Google at your fingertips. It really is very easily Googleable. Um, thankfully now over the last decade, you know, we've got those resources. Um, and in terms of um, syndication, like beyond that, so beyond finding your initial community of people who can like get you going and get you started, free marketing is super important when you're not raising going out and finding the correct investors who actually know what you do and you know what they do uh, and making sure that you're having those conversations earlier and constantly pre-marketing deals um, because i just think um, a, a better way to also then run a competitive round uh, if you're not running a competitive round you also fall um, prey to potentially predatory investors so there's a couple of things that i would say uh peter and i'll go with seth other, and kind of playing off of what Peter said, other, and I don't want to call them mistakes, right, but this is all education for earlier founders, what are the other kind of mistakes when you see them raising that first round? I know you guys do a lot of mentorship and advisory work with smaller funds, like like Hannah Gray, they're investing earlier. Um, how do you guys kind of coach founders and what are the common mistakes that you might see them fundraising? And if you can apply it to the Midwest founder, great, but just kind of holistically, do you agree with what Peter said? Let me build upon what Peter said a little bit, because I actually think there's an opportunity for, when we talk about ecosystem development and communities coming together and working together, there's an opportunity not to treat everything like it's a sort of a point, like you company A is gonna raise and they're doing work and company B is gonna raise and they're doing work. And I think one of the things that worked nicely in, in uh, Colorado, not just Boulder, but Colorado more generally, is that we oftentimes would band together for things, right? Back when we were re trying to re recruit employees, uh, you know, we wouldn't have an individual firm try to bring in five employees and, and uh, recruit those employees. Instead, we had a whole bunch of firms come together, like 30, 40 firms come together, recruit in, 50, 70, 100 people to come in for like a long weekend and do it, it showed them like a whole dog and pony show. And it wasn't about, you know, I'm going to net, I have to hire this one person. It was, let's get 50 or 100 people into Boulder and hopefully a bunch of them will end up deciding to move here and I'll get my share of those. And, and the next, the other companies will as well. So we work collaboratively. And I think that can also work on the investment front, not, hey, these are five companies that are raising today necessarily, but let's, let's do things like this sort of event when we can be in person even better, right? Show off the, the waterfront and, you know, like get some people here, not, but not in a competitive, like I need to corner this investor because if, if they invest in me, they're not gonna invest in you and vice versa. But like, how do we work together and be collaborative about that? And so I think that's, you know, that's one of the mistakes that I think people oftentimes make is that they treat, they treat these things like a point process, like it's a point in time. And as Peter described, really it's, you're talking about building relationships over time that will, you know, be incredibly beneficial. And the truth is, you know, we, we often at Foundry are often introduced to a company or a fund for that matter, you know, sort of early on. And it, sometimes it's fun too that we invest in, right? Or, or the next round of that, of that company that we actually invest in. I mean, it's just sometimes it takes a little while to get there. Um, and so I think that it's important to, to kind of play the long game and think about how to develop those relationships and to do so meaningfully, right? Not just transactionally. Seth, uh, kind of in, 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 I want all three of you to answer this one because I definitely don't want to skip over it for the founders in the room, for those in Madison, Milwaukee, Green Bay, anywhere else in Wisconsin. How, how can they do that, Seth? How can they start to build their investor networks today um, with fewer VC resources around here, fewer connection points right now? How can they start to connect with groups like yours early on? Um, and then we'll talk about kind of the other resources available. but. Seth, how can they do that? Are there educational resources out there that teach you how to grow these networks or how do we get on your radar sooner? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd go back to something that Jess said, which, which is that, you know, VCs are all over the place, right, online and, and you know, everyone, everyone's got a blog or a podcast or whatever. They're all trying to show everyone how smart they are. And and so there are lots of ways to engage, right? And so, you know, I, I would I would be thoughtful about how you engage and I would, I, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at how 
infrequently, uh, really anyone doing networking, but particularly if there's sort of this targeted networking idea that people aren't, don't organize it, right? Like create a, treat it like a sales funnel, create a little bit of a spreadsheet. Here's some people I'd really like to get to know a little bit. Here's where I might find them. Here's their Twitter handles. Here's their blogs. Here's, and just start trying to interact a little bit, right? Or send them an email and say, hey, Jess, I read that thing you wrote about X, Y, and Z. I thought it was really interesting. Did you see this other article? I thought you might find it, find it helpful. Yeah. Those are great emails to get, right? Because yeah. so, so often it's, you know, it's just, hey, I'm raising, hey, Jess, I'm building the such and such of such and such. And, you know, are you interested in investing? And so, so it's very much like yes or no. It gives her an easy way of being, hey, thanks so much. Not a fit for us. Right. And at, and at Foundry, we see, I don't know, 10,000 new investment opportunities a year and we do eight. So it's like most of my email responses to those emails are, hey, thanks so much. Probably not a fit for us. Um, but if you sort of if you approach it in a different way and you're not asking for that, it's a lot easier to, to sort of start a relationship and, and you know, have at least some kind of uh, some kind of discussion, understanding that not everyone's going to uh, going to respond affirmatively or positively to that. But you just need a handful that, that you kind of get get warm and start to build these relationships with and hopefully they'll be meaningful and impactful right and you can ask them questions and you know if they never become an investor because that's the likely outcome that's fine but but maybe uh someone will so i would i would think of it that way yeah i'm just not a transactional thinker so i just i shy away from that yeah and just to piggyback on that a little bit um so one common mistake i would say particularly in this market just to dial back to that part of the conversation quick is we're in such an unprecedented market right now that just because you can raise money at a certain valuation doesn't mean that that is right for you and for your business and for your employees and for your outcome. So we've been doing a lot of education with founders when they're like, oh, but so-and-so will pay 15. We're like, that's great. We will not. But this is why we want to help you just think through what is an appropriate valuation for us to underwrite as a firm and for you to think about as a founder, because it's not just about what can what will somebody pay today. It's about what valuation can I not only grow into in the next twelve to eighteen months, but then exceed by two to three x for the next round in twelve to eighteen months. So you want to be really thoughtful about that and not just like take the highest bidder, so to speak. I mean, we lived through this in 2014, 15, where like valuations were also really bloated, and a lot of people ended up carrying flat rounds or down rounds because like the market cooled off. So. You just have to be really mindful of that as a founder and, and work with partners that will be sparring partners, but also be respectful about recognizing that like we want what's best for you and your business in the long run. Um, so that's kind of part one. And part two, playing off of what Seth said is so much of VC also is like, ask for money, you'll get advice, ask for advice, you'll get money. And so just thinking about that through the lens of like a VC's track record is their best billboard. Um, so think about companies you admire, companies you're inspired by, companies in your competitive set maybe, and then look to see who backed those companies and who are the partners that were those first investors. My partner, Kate, she was a first investor in Venmo back in 2010 at Lara Hippo, and she still to this day has founders reaching out to her wanting to know how did Vendor do it. So we see a ton of incredible deal flow there in fintech. Same with Genies, which just got a huge markup from Mary Meeker. Obviously that's a really interesting sector right now. So we see a ton of founders reaching out to want to know about that. So I think that you also as a founder, just think about it as a sales process to say, who are companies I admire and then who back those companies and what can I learn from them? And that way, when you reach out to them, I've met founders on Twitter all the time. If they're like, I know that um, you were early in catch and release. I really love what they're doing in XYZ. I'm at this stage of my journey. Would love to just like hear how you worked through that. And so just being thoughtful about what that outreach is and tailoring it to their experience, to something they wrote about, and then also being a resource where it's like, I would either love to learn from you and tell you about it, or I might have a different opinion on this blog post you just wrote about X, Y, and Z, like would love to just riff on it with you. Like those are the best ways to just build trust and build relationships because we as VCs, like we want to, we want to learn how an entrepreneur thinks and just being really thoughtful about your sales process for fundraising and, and taking data-driven approaches to build investor relationships is just another precursor to how you run your business and how you prospect candidates for talent, how you prospect customers, how you prospect strategic partners or talent. So for us, it's just like all of these threads fit together in terms of that data point and that line to getting us to a yes. Peter, how about you? 
Yeah, no, honestly, I think both Seth and Jessica, you answered that like absolutely perfectly. I would say like there are lots of different other hacks you can do. I'm like very much the uh, relationship builder guy at my my firm. I used to do all the fundraising, so I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, a lot of time on social media. We've got some of our best deals through Twitter, Facebook, a, yeah. a text from somebody, you know. Um, one of our best deals that we got um, was cold inbound. It was just really good cold inbound, right? Um, and actually, to, to Seth's point earlier about um, you know companies that are based elsewhere, right? And how do you get attention? You might not have the network at all. Um, you know, they did an incredibly good job at like hunting us down, understanding what our prior interests were, and like being really really targeted. And this was a company in Belgium. This was like someone really far away. And in the end, and this is probably quite interesting in, in the context of, you know, where should you be based? Should it be in, in, you know, San Francisco or should it be in Belgium? We kind of brought them half between Belgium and to North Carolina. And in fact, after we pushed them so, so much to come to North Carolina, because obviously the market is much bigger for cellular agriculture, um, the US market in general, they then decided actually to split their science team and production in Belgium and then have more of the headquarters in, in the States. So it was this interesting like hybrid model. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm so oftentimes just say to our entrepreneurs, hit me up on any platform you see fit, just make sure you know how to communicate me to me on that platform. Yeah, I will say that when I was, I came from a corporate VC where I was investing in early stage um, marketing tech, digital media SaaS, and I would get cold emails sometimes that said, dear sir, I am a series B biotech company. I'm like, first of all, just take a look on LinkedIn, look at the homepage of our website and you kind of figure out if it's not a fit. So it's just like, know who you're reaching out to, know why you're reaching out to them. The other really good hack that you could do is if you love a VC fund and you're, you just would love to get an intro to them, look at the entrepreneurs that they backed and try to befriend them and get advice from them because warm warm introductions through our portfolio founders are also always a way to at least get a meeting so that can also just be a really good hack to see like and, you know yeah. also to jessica's point and to Seth's point knowing kind of like the partners who have led deals uh, in a certain area that interests you or is relevant to what you're building what I would also do is go into LinkedIn and figure out all the partners that they're connected with at other firms, because they tend to, probably to your point, Seth, like mesh around certain thematics. Um, so you can probably uh, believe to some degree of probability, a high degree of probability that you'll find like-minded people through that node in a network. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Seth, just for those on the phone, for those on the uh, on the webinar here that are more service providers, economic development, even government folks that are here, you've, done, you've, you've seen this and you've gone into new markets and what's attracting, kind of back to our very first question here in Wisconsin, what can groups like that that are, that are still in the startup community, what can they do to be more attractive? Is it, should we be exposing our winners better? Should we be having more webinars like this for you guys, connections, relationships? How do we draw you to Wisconsin and what can we as a collective group together do better? Yeah, I mean, I think about, I really think about everyone in a startup ecosystem should, ecosystem should try to be an enabler, right? So when I'm in a new startup ecosystem, I did this in Minneapolis when I started going there um, and it was, I don't know, it was 10 years ago, let's say, it was sort of just starting to develop. And, and what I would try to do is just be like a cheerleader for people that like felt like they we're ready to do something, right? And so, um, you know, just be someone who encourages, like, hey, what what would be helpful for this ecosystem? And like, you can do it, right? You should, and you know, I would hear from these people all the time, like, ah, I really think we should get someone to do X and Y. I was like, why don't you do that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sounds like, love that idea. You should do yeah. it, right? How can I how can I help you do it? I can help you amplify it. I can, you yeah. know, I could give you a couple thousand dollars to buy food. Like you tell me, what do you need like to, to get it done? And I, and I feel like all the participants, right? This is not just directed at, you know, government service providers, et cetera. But I think especially those people that are in those categories should be trying to be enablers, right? I mean, so it's not about how do you build uh, some sort of moat around your thing and what you're doing. It's how do you collect all sorts of different people from your ecosystem and and help prop them up right and so you know i mean boulder was sort of an extreme example of this which is i think a little bit why you saw startup weekend and startup week and tech stars and 
up global and you know all of these sorts of the pledge one percent for that matter all come out of the boulder ecosystem because there was this sort of looking outward how do we help how do we float all boats rather than sort of how do i protect my little little uh, moat here mm -hmm. uh, mentality that we had in boulder but i think that's to me that's what's really key right and i think that that's true for anyone but but particularly for the folks that you were describing Jessica, you're from Minnesota, like you said, um, and you went to Indiana and you're Midwest, like it or not. I know you're in New York now, but uh, I am a West fan though for everybody on this call. Just, just putting it out there. <laughs> what is a good what's a good to assess point here on how other ecosystems have built over time, knowing Wisconsin a little bit better? And I will say thank you to all of you for taking intros to all of our startups that reach out to us. What's a good starting point here um, in Wisconsin? Um, I think a good starting point here is aligning with some of the local firms here. I think groups like Generator, the Accelerator here has done an excellent job just cultivating an investor community. It's just all about continuing to create content and celebrate your wins together. Um, I think a lot of it is about content marketing and there is so many great talent, great company, great insights, great market opportunities that having a good content market strategy and just building that following and encouraging different social hooks can just be a great way to build audience because VCs talk, VCs get FOMO, VCs have herd mentality. And so there's just a lot of interesting things if you discover it. Some VCs take more of an initiative than others, um, but it's starting to just continue to amplify and elevate those wins across channels and tagging different people and being thoughtful about what that strategy looks like too, can just be a way to continue to bubble out the spider web. Um, and Seth, I don't want to forget about this because I know, because again, as we're talking about resources and jumping off points, your most recent book, which I'd invite you, please guys go check it out. It's on Amazon. Um, and I'm sure Seth has it on the Foundry Group website. Maybe you can chat the link afterwards, but can you talk a little bit about what's in that and how it could help some of the Wisconsin founders around here and shamelessly maybe plug the startup communities books that your other uh, folks have? Because I Admittedly, I mean, I, I I like that one. I like venture deals a lot. So please go through them. Yeah, mine's a little different. It's sort of, uh, I talked about a little different trend. I, I actually think it could be really interesting for, uh, well, it could be interesting for anyone. So everyone on this call should go and go and read it. But it's, it really describes, it's called The New Builders. I mean, it describes the broader startup ecosystem, right? And the some of the challenges, frankly, that uh, entrepreneurial dynamism is having in the United States, specifically that entrepreneurship in the U.S. is actually declining pretty profoundly. And the reason is, and we don't think about it because the venture world is sort of on fire, but only about 1% of businesses take money from venture capitalists. Um, only 17% take money from banks. So there's this huge swath in the middle that takes takes money from friends, family, or you know, home equity line or credit card. Um, and the book describes the changing nature of people that are starting businesses, specifically that um, more women and people of color are starting companies um, than at any time in our in our history. And in fact, white males are probably the minority of business owners right now. Uh, fastest growing group of new entrepreneurs are black women. Um, and we we haven't done a really good job of keeping up with our sources of financing for those for those types of businesses. Um, and so the book describes some of these challenges. And, and, and you know, if you care about Main Street, or you care about uh, sort of entrepreneurial activity and, and frankly, you know, jobs in the US GDP, you know, 50% of employment is driven by small business, 40% of US GDP is driven by small business. Like these trends are should be really troubling. Um, and we tend to gloss over them because we see the tech entrepreneurial ecosystem taking off. And one of the unfortunate things that's happened, and we, we talk about this a lot in the book, is that tech entrepreneurship has taken over the idea of entrepreneurship. Um, whereas we used to think of entrepreneur, the, the term entrepreneur is referring really to any small business owner, uh, you know, back in the day, a farrier or a blacksmith and, you know, corner, corner store owner. And we've narrowed that definition. And then we've, we've come to only focus on these sort of high growth businesses, nothing wrong with the venture model. And I certainly, you know, I mean, I've spent my career in venture, so I'm not suggesting that that's a bad thing. And a lot of the tech businesses, by the way, become that are funded by venture capitalists become enablers of the broader small business ecosystem, right? Think about restaurants that are using Toast or Open Table or something like that, um, or, or any any sort of software package or point of service package that, that a small business might be using or a corner store might be using. But Seth, anyway, the book describes those those trends and, and talks in sort of the, the detail about things we can do to, to help strengthen our entrepreneurial ecosystems. Yeah, Seth, to build on that. And so, yeah, again, I encourage everyone to read these books. Um, and yeah, he chatted it for us. Um, Seth, how do you, so, 
when you look at kind of, because I, I, I do, so obviously we subscribe to the theory that the Midwest is going to be pretty good here in the future when it comes to venture capital returns or startups here for sure. And we've been trying to promote it for how long, but you know, you go way back, it's like Detroit used to be the Silicon Valley of the day. You had old school industrial builders and then you're right, you know, semiconductors come out and technology is the tech entrepreneur, but there are, you know, mom and pop shops around here. There are smaller, uh, maybe not venture backable, but there certainly are venture backable growth startups around here. So I think it's really interesting. Um, and like I told you yesterday, it's in my shopping cart right now. So um, I'll grab it. But um, one thing I want to ask uh, and Peter, maybe um, starting with you, where do you see, you know, the future of venture going? And if you can relate it to the Midwest, great, kind of like what Seth was talking about, these new builders and where they might arise from and how they can build up their own communities. Where do you see the next five, 10 years in venture going? Yeah, um, so it's interesting because I also really love talking about economic development. So I really wanted to chat about that too. But yes, the, the global landscape um, is quite interesting because you're seeing different population growth uh, globally. It's interesting in Europe, it's actually minus 2% by 2050. In the States, it's something like 70% population growth. Southeast Asia has incredible population growth. Africa has 220% population growth. Um, I'm actually quite active now in, in African startups for that reason. Um, and also emerging middle classes throughout Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, so I actually see increasingly global deal flow um, I think that what's interesting and what I'm really curious to do at Alpha is connecting, say, the Wisconsin cellular agriculture company to distribution in Southeast Asia. And that's what I'm really interested in is like the, the globality of venture capital and not just finding a company in a particular region, but how can you do this play between different regions and different nation states? Um, I think there's going to be a lot more of that over time. Um, yeah, I, I think think that's what I really like focus on. We really don't care in uh, social impact capital like who you are or where you're located. All we care is that you're building something that matters and it's venture scalable. That's basically it. Yeah. Jessica, next five years in venture, what do they look like for you guys? Yeah. Um, for us, we think a lot about this blend between public and private markets um, and just how that behavior is changing in terms of making venture in the private markets more liquid and what that means as an early stage fund manager as we think about liquidity in a 10 year life cycle. Um, so that I think is just gonna continue to accelerate and, and just be a fascinating trend to watch. Um, there's been a huge boom of emerging managers that have come up, um, former operators, former angels, um, spin outs, which is incredible and adds a lot of diversity. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of some consolidation, which might be like a little bit of a contrarian view. Um, I think that, you know, it can be a huge dopamine rush to deploy capital, but there is still a whole fund management side after you deploy capital. So I'm, I'm curious if we're looking five, seven, nine years down the road, um, are these franchisees? Are these just funds? Is there going to be a consolidation between these managers? What does that look like? Um, so I'd say those are a few things. I, I'm curious to see where things like the rolling fund goes. I think there's some just like new innovations around venture models that's really interesting. Um, so I'd say those are the three things, but something that we're just particularly interested and in, kind of fascinated by is, is a little bit of this blending of the public and private markets. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about, but would love to get to any questions if people have questions. I, yeah, I'm, I'm monitoring the chat. I don't see any questions, obviously. Oh. I, I can go all day. So um, please throw them in the chat. Um, Seth, how do you see not necessarily, you know, the next five years um, kind of shifting from a founder perspective, just for the purpose of this one, what are the right questions a founder should ask you in that first meeting when you take them? And I know, you know, let's put you back in the analyst associate days, but in the first meeting that they get with the firm, what are better questions an entrepreneur can ask than the kind of Jessica, you highlighted them a little bit. It's like, well, ask if the funding's right, ask if their diligence process is there are there resources out there that tell us what we should be asking and what do you expect from founders and how do they impress you in that first meeting? Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't be shy, right? Why did you take this meeting? That's a great question. <laughs> like we try to get an understanding of what, like, it's so funny how often like someone will show up. We, we take all of our first meetings, you know, as partners. So there's no, there's no filtering. Um, but they just sort of show up and they just launch into their pitch. Like, how about start with like, why are you interested in this? Right. So I think that's really important when you get to the end of the meeting, you can ask, Hey, what'd you think? Give me your reaction. 
what, and then you need to be clear about, well, what are the next steps? I actually wrote a very funny uh, blog post one time, or at least I thought funny, blog post about like when the when a VC says the, these things at the end of the meeting, this is what they mean, um, sort of to try to in, interpret it. It was sort of this amusing look at like, you know, the cliche things that VCs say, but you know, what they're really saying is, yes, this is interesting, or I'm going to say no, but I'm not going to do it to your face or you know, whatever it is. But in any event, I think like there's no, I, I, I think there's no reason not to put, the, put someone on the spot and say, hey, what'd you think? Um, and let's be clear about what the next steps are, right? And, and so I think that's really important. I think you can also ask things like, where are you in your fund cycle? Okay. That's really helpful to know because if they're late in their fund cycle, that might mean different things for, for their ability to invest and things like that. Are you looking at other businesses that are similar? Is this an industry that, I, you know, I know you've invested in the past because you've done the due diligence, or I know you haven't invested in the past because you've done the due diligence, but is this an industry that you think is interesting? What do you think you need to believe in order to believe that this is a big business? Like, what have I not convinced you of yet? Like, those are the types of things that I think are really fair game. And I, I think too many, um, founders are uh, loath to um, to feel like they're pushing, even though they're not really pushing that much. Mm -hmm. And so they, they just sort of skip that. Like they're just so happy to get to the end of the meeting and like, hey, I got in front of so-and-so uh, and they forget to do those sorts of things. So I, I would do that to frame at the beginning of the meeting so you can really set the conversation up um, and then really use that to set the conversation up, right? It's amazing to me also, just it's not really a do and don't, but it is a little bit of how often I'll be, we like to have very interactive meetings, right? I know Jess does too. Peter, just based on our conversation today, I assume you do as well. Like, I'm amazed at how often people kind of get stuck in their presentation. And I like to sort of jump right into questions like, hey, well, what do you think about that? And instead of just saying, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Let's jump to slide seven. I'm, I'm going to let me talk about that. Or, you know what, let me explain this one thing first. And then let me then let's jump right to it. They sort of are like, uh, OK, I'll get to that in a minute. And then they just keep going with their presentation. And after yeah. you do that a few times, you're like, they're not listening like this is and that part of what you're looking for is like, is this someone who's who's coachable, who is adaptable, who thinks about things on their feet, things like that. And so, you know, being thoughtful at the beginning of the meeting and then actually using the information you gather as part of the meeting to craft the story for, uh, you know, what that particular uh, partner wants to hear, I think is really important. Yeah. We did get one, and Jessica, I know you can add to this for sure, um, but Peter, I have one question from the chat, sorry. So best way for underrepresented immigrant refugee founders to get warm intros to VCs? So there's a man called John Kluge, who I absolutely love, who focuses specifically on immigrant and refugee alpha, and how can we, basically transform and translate um, people coming into this country um, to become entrepreneurs. Um, so he's a great guy to talk to off the bat for that. I don't think there's like a dedicated um, resource for that, but I know he's brilliant and he's always receptive. So I would reach out to him. And Seth chatted too. I look at Unshackled Venture for who looked at that question, Nitin. Um, I think they're, they're good fund managers and they know what they're doing and they invest solely in immigrant founders across the US. So, um, but Jessica, anything to add? Last minute here we have um, other you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Seth totally nailed the the like other things to ask. Because um, again, you're, you're asking someone for like, potentially millions of dollars. You have to have a little bit of chutzpah and like you are gonna be stuck with this person too for years. So you wanna to get to know them. So just a couple of other questions that I would ask if you're in diligence and if you're at the point where you know you're getting a term sheet, you think it feels good is ask to talk to founders that failed. Um, we all have them. And if you don't, that's kind of weird. So not only ask to talk to founders that were successful but ask to talk to founders that they backed that failed because you just learn so much more about their character um, it's going to be a roller coaster. It's a very human business. And so just getting to know that VC's character more, um, we really respect when founders ask us that. Um, and also just ask, like, do you think we're a good chemistry fit? Like, what are your concerns about, you know, this kind of dynamic in this relationship? And to Seth's point, um, asking where they are in their fund cycle, that, that is a brilliant question to ask. Um, if you want to be more specific and candid, you can just say, are you writing checks right now? Um, a lot of VC firms, while they're fundraising, they might not be writing checks yet. They might be warehousing. You don't know, but it just helps you have context as an entrepreneur on just the viability of that prospect. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. It's not a big deal if they don't. It just will help you frame your thinking in terms of where they are in their process. Um, you just want to get that transparency because time is the most important thing you have as an entrepreneur and you deserve to know. So, yeah, I think asking very just like pointy questions like that will help you kind of cut to the chase to hopefully get the responses and the feedback you need. Look, Jessica, 
Seth, Peter, you guys have all been great participants. We could obviously talk about this all day as we usually do. Um, for those who want to connect with better firms um, and understand like who's in this pipeline of those who want to look at Wisconsin and the Midwest, reach out to NVNG at any time, grady at nvngia.com. Pretty easy, I can connect you to them. They'll tell me yes or no. They're all very good. They'll take the intros. Um, so thank you to Foundry Group, Hannah Gray, and Social Impact Capital for some time today. I believe Forward Fest is uh, sending this out and going to record it. So if nothing else, guys, I'll just ask that we hop off. And thanks again for the time. Thank you. For thanks, having everyone. Guys, thank you. Thanks, guys.